keepers here at Elmwood Park Zoo. We have Eric behind us filming. He's also one of the keepers. And today I'd like to introduce you to two of my friends, Rio and Sopressa, our golden lion tamarins. They're a little shy, so I'm hoping they'll hang out with us today. I have some of their favorite treats, which are mealworms. This is Sopressa, so she's our female. She's about 10 years old now, and Rio's thinking about being brave. <laughs> You can hear him making a couple of calls, asking her if it's all right to come out. And they're probably gonna be in and out. <laughs> There's usually only about one of us in here, so they're just a little confused, but I think that they'll be hanging out shortly once they get used to us. So Sopressa is about 10 years old. Her buddy Rio is about 11 years old. And tamarins typically live up to 15 years um, in captivity, but sometimes they can actually live up to 25 years old. I think one of the oldest right now um, is about 21 years old. It's okay, bud. Come on, Rio. There you go. So this is Rio. Um, he's our boy, and you can tell him apart from Sopressa if she comes back out because he's a little bit lighter in color. Um, and that is because when Sopressa came to us about a year ago, she actually came from a facility with warmer temperatures, which meant she got to spend a lot more time outside. And pretty much that sun is what attributes them to get that nice golden color. So we're hopefully in the process of actually building them an outdoor exhibit so they can go outside here as well. And then he can get a little bit more golden. Yeah, he's digging the mealworms right now. So these guys are omnivores, which means they eat fruit and insects. Um, their favorite food right now are the mealworms that I have. Come here, Suppressa. I know. So you can hear them vocalizing right now. This is their, <laughs> this is kind of their concern chatter call. Um, we call some of those, some of those calls trills. It's a way to communicate with each other. Um, so here at the zoo, we actually feed them a whole bunch of different fruits and vegetables. And they also get insects like mealworms and uh, crickets. But their favorite foods are bananas and grapes along with the insects. So these guys are about, they're only about a pound. So they're not very big. They can be between a pound and two pounds, but usually around a pound. They're about eight inches long in the body and their tail is about 12 to 15 inches long and if you'll see you can see how he has uh, long fingers and claws at the end that's because that helps him find his food in tree cavities and um and different hollowed out areas so he can actually stick those fingers in and try and get insects out that way i'm going to see i'll see if i can put some foods and feeders and see if he actually wants to participate in demonstrating but he might be a little concerned about the two of us in here, so we'll see what he thinks. Hi, bud, you're doing great. So Rio's been with us for about eight years. Him and his brother actually arrived at the zoo around 2012 from the Brandywine Zoo, so they came from another facility. And uh, his brother actually got paired up with a female at another facility. So now it's him and his new girlfriend, Sopressa, and they're getting along famously. Hi, you're doing great, bud. Yay, you can keep foraging. So you'll notice around the exhibit, we have a bunch of different um, toys and puzzle feeders hanging around. And that's because we want to keep them engaged and active. We don't want them to just get their food on a silver platter. We, we want them to kind of work for it. So we get pretty creative with some of the enrichment devices we use. This one over here is actually a, a, a birdhouse that we put food in, and then they'll actually use their little fingers and try and get in that hole and get the food out. Come on, Zopressa. So in the wild, these guys live in family groups of between um, up to about 10, like true, and they usually are made of um, mostly their offspring. And then when they reach a certain age, usually the males will kind of spread out and look for other females and then the females will also look for their own mates. Good job, Sopressa, you're doing great. <laughs> They're pretty cute. So in the wild or even in captivity, when they do have babies, they usually have twins, two at a time. And mom and dad will actually co-parent 
along with any older offspring. So they'll actually carry two babies around on their back for about five months. They're gestation, so they remain pregnant for about four months, and then they carry that baby around for about five months. They reach sexual maturity at about two years, and then they can start having babies of their own. So she's curious. She'll probably keep popping in and out with us, hopefully. I've got the goods, so she is into the mealworms. Come on, Sopressa. I know, yes, I got it. Good job. So in the wild, um, because they have so many predators and they're so small, infant mortality rate is actually pretty high. Usually about 50% of babies don't survive their first year. And that's because they have all sorts of predators. They're so little. So in the wild, they can, um, they have to be fearful of snakes and birds of prey, and also cats, any kind of felid, um, ocelots, and even if a, a jaguar got lucky, even a jaguar. These guys can actually reach speeds of up to four, uh, 25 miles per hour. <laughs> Are you confused by the camera? What do you think? I know. Good job. And they, they primarily live in the canopy of hot and humid rainforests of Brazil on the eastern side. So they're high up there. They can usually be found between 60 and 100 feet off the ground. Come on, Rachel. Good job, buddy. And because they live so high up there, they need to be good jumpers so they can get from tree to tree. So they can actually jump 30 plus feet. I believe their cousins, the red-handed tamarind, has been known to jump at about 60 feet between trees. So I imagine these guys can probably get pretty close to that as well. Here you go. Oh, good job. So these guys are a really, really interesting conservation story because in the 1970s, there were actually only 200 left in the wild. 200, that was it. So the Brazilian government paired up with a couple of zoos, including Smithsonian's National Zoo in Washington, D.C., and they started a breeding and reintroduction program with golden lion tamarinds in captivity. And then they essentially were able to uh, breed these monkeys and then start a program in Brazil where they began releasing them back into the wild. So in the 1970s, there were only about 200. Then this breeding program began. And then in the late 90s, they were actually able to reduce, uh, reintroduce a whole bunch and brought their population up to almost 4,000 monkeys, 4,000 golden lion tamarinds. And that's pretty cool, but then unfortunately, um, yellow fever, which is a disease transmitted by mosquitoes, decimated their population and brought them back down to about 2,500. But the cool thing is that one third of all golden lion tamarinds are uh, ancestors of that breeding program in zoological facilities. So essentially, these guys have cousins that are living in the wild. And we were able to bring those numbers back up because of captive breeding programs in zoos. Good job, Sopressa. So their main dangers in the wild besides predators are actually habitat loss and deforestation. Early on in the 70s, the, the biggest problem was part of the pet trade. A lot of people would think that these guys are really cute and can make good pets, but they actually don't make really good pets. If you look at some of the branches that they're on, you'll notice that they're really greasy and oily. And that's because these guys love to scent mark. That's how they can tell their family members apart from other individuals. So what they'll do is they'll actually use their urine and different oils on their body and rub it against these branches to make it smell like them. So they're pretty greasy. So they don't really make great pets. But luckily they stopped that pet trade or tried to put a halt to it. So that's not the biggest threat to them right now. Right now the biggest threat is deforestation and fragmentation. So what that means is a lot of these individuals in the wild are in patches of forests that aren't connected or can't be connected because of major highways and things like that. So what they're actually starting to do is they're starting to build overpasses and bridges so that they can connect some of these fragments so these monkeys will be able to um, repopulate different areas and breed with each other so that it's not all the same population in one section. 
So they started a big project, um, I, I believe on one of the major highways in Brazil, and that overpass should be completed fairly soon, and that will allow the monkeys to reach their other monkey friends across the highway, and then they're hoping to plant tree corridors to connect other patches of fragmented forests. Come on. Come on, Sopressa, you can come back out. You're doing great. So you'll notice they're going in and out of holding right now. That's their safe space. So we obviously don't want to make them do anything. So if they want to go inside, they certainly can. Uh, but I'm really glad that they're hanging out with us and, uh, and thinking about staying around. But they are small and timid, so we'll see how often they want to come back in and out. All right, so now we're going to start some questions. Cameron would like to know, how much time do they spend in trees? They spend all of their time in trees. So like I said, these guys live in the hot human forest of Brazil, and they spend all their time in trees. They are diurnal, so they're active during the day, but usually in the hottest part of the day, like mid-morning and afternoon, they will actually take a nap because it gets really hot. And then at night, they'll sleep in tree cavities, and they rotate those cavities every day. So every day they'll sleep in a new nest spot, and that's just to continue checking out their territory and foraging for food. Faith would like to know how high they climb. So they can climb very, very high, and they tend to spend most of their time about 100 feet up in trees. That's where they like to hang out. Are you still with me, Laura? Do you just want to check out the other stuff? That's fine. So you can hear them chatting with each other. Gretchen would like to know when their birthdays are. Rio was actually born on March 28th in 2009, and so Pressa was born on May 6th um, in 2010. Come on, guys! Liam would like to know if they like to play with the hanging bucket. Yeah, they do actually. Um, we put a bell on there to make it a little bit more fun, and we put food in there. So they'll forage in there and look for all sorts of food. Good job, Rio. But they really, unlike the uh, sake monkeys, they're more into food. So unless there's food involved, they don't really care too much about toys, but they like spending time foraging. So as long as we can make it difficult for them to find their food, they, get a, they spend a lot of their time doing that. Okay, Carla would like to say that they sound like birds. Is that a defense mechanism? That's kind of just their natural chatter. So if they're really upset, they'll do something kind of like a really loud chirping trill sound, and then they'll just all run, they'll run away. And like I said, they're really quick. They can be about 25 miles per hour. And I mean, they're so small and light that they can pretty much run through the entire treetop and uh, just get to where they need to be and take cover. If they get upset or if they're feeling aggressive, what they'll do is they'll actually puff up their bodies arch their back like a cat, if you've ever seen a cat stretch, and then they'll open their mouth and kind of arch walk towards you and try and threaten you with how big and tough and intimidating they are, even though they're, you know, only about a pound. Okay, let's see, another question. Durham would like to know what the difference is between tamarins and monkeys. That's a really great question. So if you saw our Saki Monkey chat last week, you would like to know what the difference between these little guys and those guys are. So tamarins are part of a group called calatrichids, and what that means is they're just small monkeys. So they still are a monkey, um, but they are kind of more specialized into the tamarin classification. They also share that group calatrichids with marmosets. So there's tamarins and marmosets, and then there's other groups of monkeys like the sake monkeys, um, and these guys all encompass the group that we like to call New World monkeys. So tamarins and marmosets are the closest, closest related, and then you get up to some of the bigger guys like sake monkeys and squirrel monkeys, and then even bigger like howler monkeys and spider monkeys. Amy would like to know if they can get COVID, and that is a really great question. So New World primates specifically, are, um, they can get infected by diseases that humans have. There have not been any cases of New World primates, um, even tamarins, contracting COVID-19 from anybody, but we definitely want to take precautions to make sure that doesn't happen. 
I suspect that they probably could just because they can also get yellow fever. Good job, so press up like humans can. So we like to take precautions and always wear masks and gloves around our primates because they can even get the common cold from us. So we just don't want to give them any chances of getting sick so they can keep being healthy and happy. Owen and Tyler would like to know if they have family members here. They do not currently have family members here. Um, so Pressa came from a facility, I believe in California. Was it Pressa? I think it was Pressa. Um, it was Pressa. Okay, I'm getting the nod of approval. And uh, Rio and his brother Soleil came from Brandywine Zoo and then Soleil went to a different facility. So these guys uh, are not, we are not planning on breeding them anytime soon. Um, but they do have each other and we are thinking maybe one day of introducing them to the sake monkeys because we have seen that work at other facilities and then maybe they could have more friends. Michael the iguana actually used to live with these guys for a while and they absolutely loved him. I have a couple of pictures of them hugging him and taking some of the, uh, the skin off of him that he was shedding. Michelle would like to know if they can learn shapes and colors. They certainly can. We actually do... Um, a bunch of different training with these guys, including target training. And we can help them distinguish uh, colors. Come on, this goes to Pressa. You can come back here. What do you think? She's like, I'm unsure. I know, it's been a busy day for you guys. Come on, Rio. So um, a lot of facilities will actually do something called station training in which they have their monkeys learn a shape and a color. And then they'll put that in an area of the exhibit and the monkey learns to stay by that shape and color so they can get rewarded with food. Okay, and I have three more questions before we let these guys finish their breakfast. Joseph would like to know what their favorite toy is. Um, I would say one of their favorite toys that I've seen them really enjoy is that red car that uh, one of our wonderful donors gifted us on Amazon. You'll probably see pictures of it if you go on our Facebook page. And it's a car swing that's meant for toddlers. And we put it in here and they sat in it all day. They absolutely loved it. Actually, a lot of these toys and enrichment devices have been donated to us through our Amazon wish list. So if you see something that you like, that you would like to gift the monkeys, feel free to do so. They enjoy playing with a bunch of different things, and you never know what they end up liking, like that car. They, they really love that car. Heather would, know, would like to know if we can release them into the wild. So these guys, probably not, um, but some of their siblings maybe, and other generations. So when they did reintroduce those tamarins back into the wild from their captive breeding program, they actually had to endure a monkey boot camp in which they learned how to be wild monkeys again. So they would have to learn that, hey, sometimes these branches swing a little bit and not everything is nice and structured and their food isn't always going to be easy to eat. Actually, one of the most difficult things that they found that the tamarins were having a problem doing was actually opening up a banana because in zoos and a lot of other facilities, we give them bananas already peeled and cut up. So they had to teach them to do that all over again. There's actually a really good book called 13 Golden Monkeys, I believe by Benjamin Beck. And he writes all about the uh, 13 golden lion tamarins that were first reintroduced back into the wild. So if you want to learn more about their story, you can check that book out. And then finally, Victoria would like to know if they're at the bottom of the food chain. They're not at the bottom, but they're pretty close. So like I said earlier, they eat insects, but they'll also eat small animals as well. So if they can get their hands on a frog or a lizard, they'll eat that as well. And even a fish if they're lucky. Oh, what'd you say? Snake. Uh, snake, yeah. Like spaghetti. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, we have seen them spaghetti, um, small snakes on, on video before. Do you want to come over here? What do you think? I was wondering what serpent <laughs> <laughs> swimming through the water. You can't see my snake face. That's the problem. Um, so I think these guys are done with us today. And I would love to answer any more questions that you may have. So you can comment below on the Facebook.